I'm really, really pleased to have Alan Shaheen with us to give this month's colloquium. Alan has had a lot of experience working in high tech. He's one of the co-founders of technology, which went from, you were there from the very beginning until it, be, until it went public. And uh, now Alan is the chairman of Ars Digital Corporation. It's completely due to the corporation generosity that we have this wonderful program this year. And Alan is here today to talk to us about his experiences in high tech and to give us the perspective, not from the uh, engineer's perspective specifically, but from the, the big picture, how these companies go from the ground to successful corporations. So please give me a very warm welcome. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'll start off by saying that you're very fortunate to have the, de the dedication of the people like uh, uh, Shai and Ganit and, you know, the whole team here that's, that's really been putting this together. And, uh, um, you know, I, I won't let my investors hear this, but, you know, money tends to be the easier thing to do. You know, and then the work is what's really hard and the dedication is really hard. And that's what Shai and company bring. And that's what uh, y'all also bring. And pardon my southern vernacular, but that's what y'all also bring. Uh, to the table. When I uh, came up from Virginia to Boston, they literally did beat the southern accent out of me. But I did, in fact, uh, you know, retain, you know, a few of the uh, colloquialisms that, uh, that I grew up with. Um, you know, what I'd like to talk about today is, you know, the topic that uh, uh, was, you know, what's it like to work in a high-tech company? I actually struggled with, uh, you know, what, what's, the, what's the theme of that? Because so much has changed you know, over the past years since I first got in the business in the early 80s, um, you know, to now, you know, when you go through the, the dot-com internet bubble, if you will, that we're now, you know, watching burst in a spectacular way, you know, and so life is so different now than it was even nine months ago um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, to really say anything other than that, you know, life is extremely dynamic, you know, and uncertain when you're working with a, uh, you know, a high-tech organization. But, uh, uh, what I really want to do is take you through a little bit of the history, uh, you know, in the life of a a startup company that does, uh, you know, grow over time. And I was one of the founders of Cambridge Technology Partners. I joined there in 1985 when it was an MIT spinoff. I did have to make it to MIT at some point, um, and you know, was part of that organization. Uh, in two different phases, uh, you know, up until we got to be about 4,500 people, and I was running all of the international operations out of London, um, and left there in uh, you know early part of 1999, you know, before I decided to uh, to, to jump in here and and join Ars Digita in April of uh, of 2000. But in any case, what is it like to work with high, uh, you know, a, a, a high tech company? And what is it like to work in a high tech company as it goes through, through these different transitions? And most importantly, what are some of the trade offs between different types and styles of high tech companies? Okay? You know, because I have been at the very, very raw um, you know, employee number one circumstance. Okay? And there was a reason that I did that. And I have been uh, you know, an executive in a publicly traded company. Uh, that had 4,500 people, of which I was responsible for about a third of it. Okay, and then there are other examples that are even more so, if you will. You know, like working for Sun Microsystems or Oracle or XYZ. You know, big name. You know, then there's Microsoft up in Redmond, and you know, and uh, and so forth. Actually, when I was interviewing, um, uh, when I was graduating from university. Uh, I actually, the first job that I took was teaching at the, uh, the, the local trade school down in Harvard Square. And, uh, you know, did that for six months. And then it was time for me to get a real job because I had to pay off my student loans. And I was, I was looking for a variety of, uh, you know, of different uh, types of jobs. At that time, getting a job in, in the high-tech software side of the business was very hard. You know, take yourself, and I'm going to date myself, but I'll do it anyway. Take yourself back to 1984, 1985, okay? You know, the economy was in that very delicate time that they called stagflation, okay? Which we haven't experienced since, but which means that there is no growth and prices are rising, okay? So, you know, in a very, very bad time, you know, the only thing that was really active at that point in time was hardware. You know, there was a lot going on with hardware. Sun was this emerging company. Microsoft was this emerging company. 
um, you know, but nobody really knew much about them. You know, Unix workstations, what were they? Because in those days, the principal thing that business used were these proprietary operating systems running on IBM mainframes and DEC mainframes and things of that sort. So that's back in 1984 and 85. So uh, I actually had a, uh, a job offer from uh, Microsoft um, in 1980. Uh, 84, 85, I can't remember what it was. You know, and, and basically, I hadn't graduated yet, and they wanted me to leave before I graduated. You know, Bill Gates was actually a Harvard graduate, left before he got his degree, and so he wanted everybody to be in his image. And when I said that I wouldn't do that, you know, it really didn't bode well for my future at Microsoft. Um, but in any, any case, uh, so that, that's one point. But what I, I did end up doing is I took a job teaching. And I was teaching discrete mathematics for computer science because I, you know, I happened to, uh, you know, need a job at that point in time, and that's what was uh, what was out there. So I was teaching, uh, you know, Boolean logic, Turing state machines, that kind of stuff, and actually fell in love with teaching. Just loved it, loved it, loved it. It was like a terrific thing, you know, because of the enthusiasm and motivation of the people. And decided that's what I really wanted to do. But here I was sitting on top of these big stack of student loans, okay, you know, and working my way through, you know, how do, how do I go, go about this? I remember at the time I interviewed, you know, over the course of three months with 29 <coughs> different companies, okay? You know, 29 different companies got maybe, you know, half a dozen repeat interviews, got one job offer, okay? Uh, one job offer, and it was actually it was a job offer for the company that I really wanted to be part of. At the time, it was a company called Cambridge Institute for Information Systems. Okay, uh, it was a company based on Vassar Street. I don't know if y'all know where Vassar Street is, um, and it was a group of you know 20, 25 uh, you know MIT grad students plus two MIT professors who had this major uh, contract with AT and T to train all of AT&T's sales and technical support staff on um, the advantages of the Unix operating system and the basics of computing, okay? <clears throat> so anyway, I got this job offer and basically decided you love teaching, okay? You only got one job offer. It's fate, <laughs> you know? And so uh, that was that's the first point that I want to... Uh, uh, I wanted to put out on the table that so much of what takes place is, you know, is fate and deciding what you want and what is really most important to you. And at the time, what I decided was really most important to me was that I wanted to be in Boston, okay, uh, you know, for all of the right reasons. I had a relationship here. Um, the, uh, the second thing is I really enjoyed the interaction of teaching, okay, and that was the criteria that I, I went after. And uh, I wanted it to be, you know, in the high-tech arena. Um, you know, because in some way, shape, or form, I wanted my degree to be useful. So, you know, there you go. I took this job, you know, jumped right into it, and in turn, it was a very exciting time. Because if y'all remember, AT&T used to be this big monopoly that owned all of phones ever. They didn't used to be local and long distance. It was all one. It was big AT&T. And the government, much as they're trying to do with Microsoft right now, went into AT&T and basically said, you must split up into separate pieces, okay? And AT&T agreed to do this, agreed to split up their business in order, you know, on the condition that the government would allow them to get into the computer business. So they're like, great, we're going to get into the computer business because that is the future, all right? Because they believe that computing, okay, was going to be the next major growth area along with communications. So the... Uh, they got what they wanted at, at one level, but then they took a look and they said, oh my God, we have got 300,000 people in our company, okay? Um, 20,000 of whom are salespeople, 10,000 of whom are sales support people, none of whom know anything, you know, about computing and computing technologies, okay? All of whom know a lot about data communications. But nobody knows anything about computers. And, you know, what happened is they found this wacky firm in Cambridge 
that had a training program about getting people up to speed on the basics of computing and up to speed on the basics of the Unix operating system. And that's the company that I joined. So you know, the, first, the, the first thing is that figure out what it is that really is most important to you. You know, It has to do with, you know, and the way that I do that is really threefold. It's about the people that you work with. It's about, you know, I call it the people factor. I call it the content factor. It's all about you know, what it is that you're working with and what's really important to you. Then the, the, uh, the third thing is what I call the greed or ambition factor, okay? You know, which has to do with you know, money, comp, title. And then the fourth thing is the lifestyle factor, all right? And you balance that all up into what it is that you really want to do from a job perspective. So this thing all fit for me, jumped into it, and I'm going to get to the, the, next phrase, the, the next phase of the situation, which is no matter what you think you're getting into, when you start with a small startup, high-tech organization, it will not be the same after you have been there for a year, maybe even six months, okay? And let me explain why I believe that so strongly, all right? You know, because I joined this great company because, well, right, you know, the people were terrific, right? The content was teaching, you know, the work that we did, I loved that. It was, content was also high tech, I loved that. You know, on the ambition factor, hey, I just needed a job, all right? So that was, that was pretty easy. And on the lifestyle thing, you know, I really didn't know what to expect. But it turned out that, you know, when you are going into a company that is a, uh, uh, you know, an early stage startup company, it will consume you and consume your life. And if you're not prepared for that, it's not right for you either, you know? Especially when it's your, your, first, your first entry into the job market. It was my first thing, you know, basically out of university. You know, the, the teaching thing was about six months worth. So it was my first thing out of university. It, that is the time when you go out and you make a mark and you prove who you are and what you are and what you're capable of doing. You lay the groundwork, okay? So, you know, small, focused, all-consuming, you know, and, uh, you know and, and I jumped in. So here we're going. You know, we're working this thing through. We're working this thing through. And you know, and the, um, the guys who were running the place um, were two MIT professors, both absolutely brilliant, one visionary in his brilliance, but really, really weak on the operational implementation side. You know, the other, also brilliant, but really good operationally speaking. Okay? So they, they made a great compliment to, uh, you know, to one another in terms of running the company. Now, I was naive at the time and didn't recognize, you know, what are some of the things you need to be taking a look at when you're joining a startup company, you know, in terms of what does the management look like? Have they been through it before? Do they know what they're doing? Remember, you know, my basic need was I need a job, you know, and this satisfied that part of the equation. But when I take a look back, these two founders complemented each other very nicely because one was externally sales, marketing, vision oriented. The other was much more operationally implementation oriented. They complemented each other, okay, very nicely. And in a group of 25 people, basically, you really don't need much management typically, all right? You, you just need folks that can go out there and make sure that you got, you know, the contracts in place to, uh, to do the business. So, you know, I came in there, and then another factor that I hadn't considered was, you know what, we only have one client, okay? We got one client, one contract, that feeds everybody. Again, at the time, I had no clue, okay? I had no clue and, uh, you know, didn't really take a look at what the business model was. Well, the business model at the time was basically, we've got a contract, okay, with this major customer, AT&T, such that uh, what we would do is every year offer a certain number of course days, okay, and there was a contract that said every course day, um, you know, you could do up to a certain number of people. And, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of money per person day of courses. And then there was a certain amount of money that they would pay us for the development of the courses. Okay? So that's what the contract looked like with a one-year cancellation clause. So anyway, we're going through this and we're going through this. And it was great. It was fantastic because the people were terrific. I loved the teaching. Every, you know, the courses were one and two weeks long, and at the end of every course, we'd always get 
everybody in the company together, all 25 of us, and we'd sit down and we'd say, what went well, what didn't go well, what are we going to change next time, what are we going to do differently, how are we going to grow this thing, you know, should we change our content. It was fabulous because you knew everybody, you communicated with everyone, you had input at all levels, you had direct access at all levels. It was a lot of fun. You know, it really, really was a lot of fun. Okay. So we're going through and we're doing this and it's about a year into it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I remember um, sitting down and we're having this discussion. And, you know, all of these things were hidden from me at the time. But, you know, apparently the relationship with AT&T was not a stable one necessarily. Okay. You know, because our visionary founder, you know, had visionary ideas uh, and had visionary ambitions. And sometimes that ran, you know, amok of what, you know, AT&T wanted. So going back and forth, you know, basically, um, somebody sat down. We came up with the, you know the notion of, you know what, we've only got one customer, and basically that customer can pretty much tell us what to do, because if they were to say to us, we no longer want to be your customer, then basically what happens is we don't have a business anymore, and so then somebody came up with the notion of, you know what, we really need to get other customers. <laughs> which was a pretty bright concept at the time. It was somewhat revolutionary because, you know, we were all enjoying ourselves kind of hanging out there, going through this whole notion of you know your schedule, you know your courses. During a course week, you know, it really is 70, 80 hours. And during a non-course week, yeah, you can basically clip back to 40 or 50 and, you know, and, and life is okay. You know, and this meant all sort of change and all sorts of different stuff, okay? You know, the other thing that we kind of realize is that, you know what, the courses that we do are not just about training people on technology. They're also about motivating people towards the value of technology, okay? And again, I, it, it's hard for me to really take you back into what life was like in 1984-85, but at the time, people thought of technology as automating stuff that people really didn't want to do, okay? It basically meant if I've got a room full of a hundred clerks, I can get a computer in and automate that stuff so that all I need is ten clerks. Okay? That was what computing was all about. It was in the days of where, you know what? Why do we need so many people to write checks? Why do we need so many people to manage payroll? It was, it was all about automation. All right? So it was kind of like, uh, you know, um, it, it, was, it was boring okay? you know, from, from that standpoint. And what we were doing is opening up the possibilities to look, you can use technology to make you more effective uh, and more interactive with your customers. That was the real exciting thing that we started to pitch. And we found that the internal AT&T salespeople got very, very excited about that. So somebody hatched this idea. Um, and you know, the notion was basically, look, you know what we should be doing? Um, we're doing such a great job motivating these salespeople. Why don't we just propose to AT&T? You come to MIT. You have these two MIT professors. Invite your customers, okay, to this program, and we will motivate them about the advantages of the open, you know, the open system Unix operating system, which AT&T was pushing very hard on the AT&T platform. Okay, you know, as a marketing event. So lo and behold, AT&T said, sounds like a great idea. And we started doing, in addition to our technical training programs, these one and a half and two and a half day programs for senior executives, well, for executives that AT&T would sponsor to come to the program. They'd pay us to do the program. We would present to them the advantages of strategic computing, how you use technology strategically, and where you know, AT&T fits into this. We'd get paid for it, but more importantly, can anybody figure out what the, the real benefit to the company was at the time? We got the business card of everybody who came through the door. Exactly. We got the business card of everybody who came through the door, okay? Which AT&T you know, had those business cards and what they were doing is they were following up with them to potentially get a sale on computer hardware. And what we were finding is that, you know what? Um, people were, uh, didn't know how to use technology uh, strategically. Okay? 
you know, because basically they were still in the automation mode. Anderson Consulting, you know, uh, they were the big six back then, or big seven, or big eight. You know, they keep contracting until they become the, you know, the big one. The um, it was Price Waterhouse and Anderson, et cetera, et cetera, were basically whenever you needed any application done and you wanted a consultant, you would basically go to uh, you know one of the accounting firms. You'd have them build for you your general ledger system, okay? And that's you know the way life was done, and it was all time and materials. Uh, and, and we started noticing, you know what? People like this whole notion of strategic computing. They like this whole notion of prototype-driven development. They like this whole notion of rapid turnaround development. And then somebody came up with the idea was, you know what? Why don't we actually try to build a custom application for somebody? Okay, Another revolutionary concept. I think I had been with a company when I joined in May 85. You know, and then this was now... Um, May '85, and this was early '86. So I hadn't been there a year, and we, you know, we'd gone through, you know, this transition. And somebody said, "Let's, you know, we're getting people so excited about this whole notion of strategic computing. Then they go back, and nobody's able to fulfill it. Why don't we try to do something?" And then we came back, and we we realized, you know, we don't know how to do it either. <laughs> you know, so it was a bit of a problem. We started to work and figure out, well, you know. We can, we can figure this out. We're all bright, smart people. We had grown at that point to about 50 people now. We doubled in size. We got bright people coming from all over. You know, and so what we did is said, hey, look, the first thing we'll do is we'll demonstrate to people how effective we can be by you know, doing a prototype. So we used to do these things that we called rapid solutions workshops. Okay? You know, and, and we told people, bring us your most difficult business problem that you've been trying to solve for at least six to nine months and we will deliver a prototype for you over a three week period of time. That last week we'll work directly with your people so that we can prototype a potential application. Okay? And uh, you know and basically um, you know we started to pitch this concept. You know, a few people took on the idea and I remember, you know, the very first time that uh, you know that we did that, I was running one of the groups because you know uh, people felt like with my Harvard background I could actually talk a lot. Um, and we went there, and, and the basic notion was sort of the following: you know, the old way of developing applications is you build everything from scratch. Our way of developing applications was why do that? There's a lot of stuff that's already out there. So what you should do is take this new platform, this Unix platform, and use it to extract data from all of these other sources and build your front-end application on the Unix system extracting the data from your existing environment. You know, it was kind of simple. Um, and that's how our first prototypes went. And what we would do is, you know, five or six at a time. And I remember the first one that I ran was a, it was, it was amazing. It was the, the client was, Terrifically, you know, the, it was almost motivational. I mean, I, I don't want to get to the point, but the we had their team there for uh, for the first week. One of the guys actually literally had a heart attack during that period of time. We worked him so hard, I, and I, I kid you not, he had to go to the hospital, and I felt badly as a result. But the uh, but he did come back because you know there was an executive presentation at the end, and he came in, um, and everybody was just so psyched about what was done, and it was fabulous. The prototype was done. We gave them the prototype. We walked away. We moved on to the next project. Everything's going great. And then three weeks later, we got the nast. The three weeks later, we got the nastiest letter from this client. You know, basically saying, "You delivered a prototype. I thought my people were going to get trained. I now have you know great expectations built up, and nobody who can deliver it." And you know, when, and rather than getting really discouraged by that, we thought, you know what? Here's the real opportunity. The real opportunity is we have to build a professional services organization that is capable of really redefining how projects are done. Okay? People are crying out for it. They're crying out for it so much that if you get them started down the path and you don't finish them you know, down the path, then they're going to get really pissed off at you. Pardon me. All right? And so that was, you know, the idea, and that was again, um, 85, 86. Yeah, somewhere late 86, when we actually had put together a full methodology, started to work it through, started to build it up, started to get some clients and started to get some projects, and and you know we're, we're growing, we're growing, we're bringing on more people. Um, 
we're growing, we're growing, we get to about 200, we hit a wall, okay? And I, you know, it, it was stunning because we, we just kept growing. And then all of a sudden, you know, we got to 200 and we tried to grow some more and then we backed down to 180. And we tried to grow some more. And this lasted for a couple of years, okay, you know, that we, we, we got there. And part of it was, you know, I, I didn't realize at the time, but we had never built an infrastructure to scale, um, you know, the organization. You know, we had, there was still just the two guys at the top. Um, and what we had done is developed management internally, myself being one. And frankly, I didn't have much of a clue when it came to management at that point in time. It was all sort of, you know, working your way through it. Uh, and so we kept going at it, and we kept going at it, and we kept going at it. And, you know, and basically what happened is, you know, it turned out that one of the founders, the operational guy, basically decided he really wanted to go back to MIT and teach. That was his real love in life, and so he left. You know, the other visionary founder decided that he liked making a lot of money, and so he wanted to stay. Um, but um, um, he just, he liked having complete control over the overall organization. And so he decided ultimately what he was going to do is, he was fine with it at 180 or 200, okay? And he would just keep it that size, and you know, that was going to be his little playground. So after, uh, you know, after a while, uh, it, it was four and a half years, um, we had changed the name and we had become Cambridge Technology Group, okay? And, uh, you know, after, uh, after a very uh, great four and a half years there, I actually left because, you know, I figured I had learned a tremendous amount there about technology, about, you know, working with people, about strategic applications and computing and all that stuff. I actually, you know, decided it was time to move on because the company wasn't going to grow anymore, okay? Didn't realize or didn't think how it was going to, uh, you know, end up and so forth. You know, but now we had gone from a training company, okay, to a training company. We're still doing that, and I actually ran most of the training at that point. Um, but we also had this emerging thing, uh, which was custom software development on a client-by-client -client engagement, okay. You know, so things had now changed pretty dramatically, and I figured, eh, you know, move on. I got a job with a company that was much bigger at that point, much more established, uh, it was called Bolt, Berenick, and Newman. Okay, uh, you know, folks who've been in the Cambridge area might have known they got bought by GE Information Systems sometime. I, you know, so they no longer have that name. But I got uh, I got a job with uh, their software products division, um, running all of their education. You know, remember I was you know still loved to teach. You know, so I was running their education business. Okay, their training business. Uh, you know, when I was doing that for a couple of years, this was an overall company of several thousand. Uh, it was split into four units. Our unit was about 500 or so. Um, you know, and suddenly I went from a place where I knew everybody, okay, and I had direct access to everybody, and I knew everything was going on, to a place where I didn't, and I had my little piece of it, and I was completely bloody lost, okay. Um, now, first thing I, I, I got to recognize, I, I got to say to you, is those first four and a half years, I had poured my heart and soul and body into it. You know, remember that relationship that I told you about in the early days? Well, that lasted about a year or so. Um, you know, because it, I was spending so much time at work, there just wasn't, uh, you know. Plus, you know, you're young and all this kind of stuff. It's not going to work out anyway, right? Uh, <laughs> so, but. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going, uh, working through that, you know, and, and the point to make is that, you know, at that point in time, at about four, four and a half years of 70 plus hours a week, pretty much nonstop, I mean, we used to have this program where literally four times a month I would pull an all-nighter, you know, eh, three to four times, let me not, you know, exaggerate, for about two and a half years, three years, three times a month, four times a month, I'd be pulling an all-nighter to get a project done. Okay. Hey, and that's what you do in the early part of your career. And then I hit a wall. Okay. And then I hit a wall, and I said, Hey, it's time to decompress. Bigger company, chill out, go in. I got to this bigger company, and you know, again, it's a personal thing. I found myself bored out of my bloody mind. Okay. Um, you know, it was a great company. There was a lot of neat things going on there. The style just wasn't right for me. I did very well, you know, I, I got in there, I got to know some people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, at the end of the day, it just turned out that, you know, I learned something about myself 
and the style that I enjoy and the style of company that I enjoy. And BBN was a great company for many things, but it wasn't right for me. Um, so after a year doing what I was doing, running the education training you know, uh, business, uh, basically what they asked me to do was say, hey, look, you know, we've got this new product that we want to launch. You know, it's a small thing. We may spin it off, take it, and work with it. So uh, you know, I decided smaller thing. I gave up you know, the, the, the big manager title and all that stuff and started doing something different. And you know, again, everything changes. So I jumped into that, and I started going around the country pitching this product okay to various people you know we started to get some traction started to get some things going i remember i even went to korea when we sold this project to the uh, you know to the korean air force which you know god knows how we got that sale but anyway um and then i was at the atlanta airport okay uh i was at the atlanta airport in 1990 1991 it was the Atlanta airport in early 1991 calling on a client, and I remember it was Sprint, and I remember the customer's name was Ragu Reddy. Okay? <laughs> it's, no lie. I, you know, if you don't believe me, I'll give you Ragu's contact information. I'm sure he's not there anymore. But in any case, you know, I thought it was a great, successful sales call. We went out there, talked to him. He was enjoying it. You know, yeah, good. But, you know, and then I'm at the, uh, I'm at the airport in Atlanta waiting for my uh, waiting for my flight and I see some people from Cambridge Technology Group that I had used to work with a couple of years ago. You know, I'd stayed in touch with everybody and, uh, you know, so I, you know, bounce over there, hey, how you guys doing? What's going on? This, that, and the other. Oh, it's all changed. You know, we've got, you know, we've, it, it's all changed. It's all changed. We have a new president and COO. He's a terrific guy and you'll like him. Why don't you do this? He happened to be there and he, you know, we got introduced. His name was Bob Jett, and he's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a very good friend of mine right now. And we talked, and we immediately hit it off. And you know, he basically goes, Have you, you know, why don't you come back? And uh, you know, I had gotten a little wiser at that point in time. And I asked a couple of questions. I said, first, well, is the original founder, you know, the visionary one, still there? He said, yeah, he is. Well, you know, uh, well how are you operationalizing the company? I said, well, you know, he said, well, we're working on it. I said, look, I would love the opportunity to come back and fulfill that dream. But you know, the situation is, you know, it's got to be a real implementation, real management operations, and this, that, and the other. And uh, you know, while, uh, while John is there, you know, it's probably not going to work. Um, so we kept talking back and forth. And I remember in May of that year, basically what happened is uh, you know, I, I, I went, and came, you know, went and spoke um, with uh, what was then Cambridge technology partners. What had happened is they were about to do a split. Okay? You know, the company, uh, the visionary founder had run the company into the wall financially. He had gone out and was now getting venture capital to buy up. You know, he was going to keep the education. He was going to now capitalize, okay, sell off, if you will, the uh, professional services or the custom software development piece. And basically, you know, he got ten, you know, got ten million dollars for it. You know, the venture people came in and put ten million dollars into the company. They brought in a CEO. They brought in a management team, um, and they were looking to augment the management team. And basically, you know, made me an offer to come back. And again, you know, I took a look at it. I said, okay, all right, <laughs> let's go through the four things again. All right, the people seem great. Again. You know, it was content that I was comfortable and familiar with. Now, from an ambition factor standpoint, you know, they made me an offer that included these things called options, and I swear to you, I had no clue of what an option was. You know, this was in 1991. I didn't, I had, didn't have any idea. So I went through and, uh, you know, and I, and I uh, looked through that, and then the, the lifestyle factor, I knew it was going to be intense. So I told them, take the job. But I'm going to take three months off, and I'm going to dedicate, you know, just to charge my batteries up. And I jumped back into it, you know. And at the end of the day, it was, you know, it was fantastic. At the time that I rejoined the company, we now had about 120 people in the organization. We had 12 million dollars in annualized revenues. Okay, we had a management team that we're building, and we had um, a mission, a vision, and a purpose. Okay, so again, if you are going to a startup company and you're going to dedicate your life you know, for that period of time, 
think about the following things. You gotta make sure that there is a clearly articulated mission and vision and value proposition to the company. I can tell you right now what Cambridge Technology Partners was all about. Okay? The first thing is that we had a differentiated business model. Okay? Uh, so the value that we were providing was one, people were out there, our differentiated business model was called fixed price, fixed time frame. Uh, you know, the world at the time was used to what they call in the, the you know, professional services a time and materials contract. You know, how many bodies, what's the daily billing rate, that's how much you pay, and we'll finish sometime. We would go in there and say, we will give you, with our methodology, a fixed price and a fixed cost on how to do it. Okay? So we'd go in and say, for that project, it is six months, seven people, and $1.2 million. Okay? And if it's under that, we get the benefit. If it's over that, you know, we eat it. We put additional resources on there to deliver it for you. Okay? So that was the first. The second thing that we had is a differentiated delivery methodology. Okay? What that meant is everybody used to have, well, we, we took a very prototype driven, iterative approach to the development of customized applications. Okay? And what we had was, you know, a methodology that really enabled people to focus more on what we called, uh, we called it the 80-20 rule. The old school of thought was, look, take 24 months and deliver something that is absolutely perfect to specification. Okay? Here is the spec and here is the, uh, you know, the system and I can match up one spec for one thing on, you know, on the, uh, on the system. You know, that's the way it used to be done. Our view of it was the world has changed, okay? You know, in 18 or 24 months, your business has changed so dramatically that the system that you just built is no longer relevant. And that what you need to do is you can get 80% of the value by focusing on 20% of the functionality. Get that out there and then get feedback as quickly as you can and fold that back into your process. You know, so the idea is, you know, at the time, we thought we were fast because we could do implementations in six to nine months, right? At RS Digital, we do implementations in three to four, you know, in, in 12 to 14 weeks, typically, okay? So, you know, things have gotten even, you know, even, even faster. But at the time, six to nine months was 50% of the time, okay? So, you know, the second thing was that we had a differentiated delivery methodology. The third thing is that we had a differentiated technology. At the time, client server technology, people who could program in C, okay? <laughs> you know, that was, that was a pretty scarce uh, resource that was out there, okay? You know, there weren't the whole, you know, bunch of GUI front ends that were out there. There wasn't a whole lot of tools that were out there. So we had those three differentiators to us. So make sure that when you go to, you know, a company, you understand what is their value proposition and what is their differentiation. Okay. Now, what was our, um, you know, our our mission? Okay, we were going to change the way that customers derived value from professional services. You know, that was our overarching theme. We went out there, and our view was that look, Anderson Consulting, Price Waterhouse Consulting, Time and Material Consulting is just wrong. You know. And so our vision, you know, was basically we're going to change the way the customers derive value from professional services. Okay? So make sure you check that out. What is the overarching purpose? And let me tell you why that's critically important. Because no matter what happens, okay, uh, no matter what you think is going to happen, no matter how well capitalized a company is, no matter how well managed a company is, okay, no matter how much you love what you do, uh, no matter how secure you think it is, stuff happens. And if the only thing that's keeping you at a particular job is simply, you know, what I call the ambition factor, that gets old real quick, you know, because stuff is going to happen that really uh, tests uh, why you're doing what you're doing. And I'll get to a couple of examples from a Cambridge standpoint in just a minute, all right? Yeah, but our real mission was we were going to go out there and we we're going to prove to the world that there is a better way of delivering value in professional services, okay?
And so that's what we were really all about, and that's what we were, you know, we were, we were going you know, the, to, to town to do. And we said that we're going to do that, and we're going to be a billion-dollar company, okay? So uh, at the time, we were $12 million, I think, a billion-dollar company. Give me a bloody break, okay? Um, you know, we actually got to be about $650, $700 million, and then we hit the wall. And so let me, let me fa fast forward you a little bit. So, you know, the bottom line is that we're going through this whole thing and we're working it and we're working it and, you know, we're getting a lot of business and life is good and we're growing, et cetera. You know, and then, um, you know, I was, uh, um, I was part of the senior management team at the time. We're going through, we're talking about plans and so forth. And our CEO sits us down one July Saturday afternoon in Boston when I really wanted to be outside because it was probably the only sunny day we're going to have all year, all right? And he basically, you know, we sat around, we talked about it. He said, look, okay, I want, you know, he went around the room and he goes, look, I want to know from each of you right now, there are about 10 or 12 of us, why you're here. You know, because we were about to start the process of taking this company to the public markets, okay? We're about to go public. Now, we ended up going public in April 93. This is July, August, okay, late July of 92, you know, and you know, you got to back up because you have to do your registration statements and the SEC. And anyway, you know, he said because none of you uh, have been through the transition from a public, from a private to a public company before, and life changes. All right, you know, because I was still at the place in time in the company we had grown to about 200 people. I actually still knew everybody's name. Okay. All of the 200 people I could go through and I could tell you what their name was, you know, if I saw them. We were about to cross over that point, okay? When you go from 25 to 50, it's still manageable, okay? There's a major leap from 50 to 200. Then when you go beyond 200, you start to lose touch with the individuals, okay? And you have to start working it through. You know, again, every body has got to be really, really clear on what the mission is what the value is, what the purpose is, and why they're doing what they're doing. And it was kind of interesting because everybody went by and they were remarkably honest. You know, some people basically said, hey, look, you know, I'm here, you know, because I want to change the industry. We really, you know, I believe in this whole, you know, uh, changing the way customers derive value from professional. I believe in it. Some people were basically, I believe in it, and I also got a bunch of options that I want to be worth something. <laughs> okay. Um, some people said, hey, look, you know, I, I want to be able to go out and say that I, you know, so it was a lot of, lot of different reasons. And I looked back on that point several years later, and the people, you could, you could really, it, it's, it's uncanny because I could have predicted who would leave when based on what they said at that, uh, you know, at, at that meeting. You know, the folks who basically were in it for the, um, uh, you know, the options, um, you know, right at the, uh, you know, the four-year, five-year period, you know, it was just either they were out of there or their work ethic took a tumble. <laughs> it was just, it was pretty remarkable. But anyway, um, so we went through that. And it, was, it, it really was a remarkable experience, kind of going through that. You know, and then, um, you know, I remember I was in Cambridge working through a bunch of things, and then, a, you know, within a year, we had an operation on the West Coast. We needed to expand geographically. And basically, you know, folks came to me and said, Alan, look, if we're really going to be able to go public, if we're really going to be able to scale this company, we've got to prove that we can do it distributed from a geographic standpoint. We got a couple of customers out in California. Go out to California. I'm like, you know, I've never been out to California, you know. Um, so sure enough, I packed my bags, and three weeks later I was out in California, um, you know, and was out there doing stuff. Uh, I had a group of 10 wonderful, dedicated people, and we started building from there. And it was the most phenomenal thing, um, you know, that, uh, that I, I did at that, uh, you know, at that period of time. You know, again, we're in the process of going public, and I'm working through, um, you know, we had, we had Hughes Aircraft was one of our customers, Nike was one of our customers, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Lockheed, um, um, now Lockheed Martin was one of our customers. And so I was basically up and down, you know, the, you know, the West Coast, flying from my, you know, my quaint little home in Venice Beach, all right, um, which was about the weirdest place you can possibly pick to live, <laughs> by the way. So anyway, you know, I'm going through and doing that. And then, uh, you know, I, I remember I was up visiting Lockheed at one point. I'm at the airport. I get this urgent page 
from you know my, my boss Bob Jett, okay, you know who is really he runs all of operations, you know, and basically it is a critical conference call. We're having problems with one of our major customers out in Florida, uh, which was um, Martin Marietta. They hadn't merged yet, but it was Martin Marietta at the time. We had a major project, you know, a couple of million dollars worth, and basically they weren't happy with what we had done, you know, and we had. We had swapped teams out in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the project because the teams, you know, the first team that was there didn't want to travel or be away from home anymore, so we swapped them out. And what happens? They basically said, either you get your A team here within the next five days, or we're terminating the contract and we're not paying you. And they owed us, you know, about uh, eight hundred thousand, I don't know, eight hundred million dollars. And we were uh, about four months away from going public, okay, or five months. If that had happened, okay, it, there, there was no, we wouldn't, you know, what would have happened is, you know, we would have shown consistent revenues like this and then all of a sudden like that. And so it would have taken us another two years to build it back up. And I remember at that point in time, uh, you know, basically getting everybody together and everybody had to find their best people, you know, and pull them off whatever project they were on and convince them that going out to Orlando, okay, <laughs> was just the right thing to do, all right? And that was one of those times where everybody had to go back and ask themselves, why am I here, okay? Why am I here? Because I'm going to have to go and talk to somebody and say, look, you know, you know the plan that you had next week, <laughs> okay, you know, whatever it was, here's what I got for you, <laughs> all right? You know, that was just one element of it. You know, the other element of it was, uh, you know, I remember getting phone calls at 6 a.m. California time. You know, Alan, look, we got to close this deal. You understand what the issue is here. We've got to make sure that we have, you know, that extra $200,000 worth of revenue in this quarter, okay? And the process started from there, building up the disciplines of being a publicly traded company, okay? You know, it's all about, hey, look, Every quarter, you make commitments, and if you don't meet those commitments, you know, the market gets pretty brutal, all right? So part of what you also need to work your way through is what environment are you looking for? You know, a startup company is pretty intense. You know, the mission is clear. It's great. Once you go public, you know, you are in many ways driven by the commitments that you make to Wall Street. Um, and I participated as an executive in a publicly traded company for 26 consecutive public quarters, okay, you know, and we we made it for 24 of those quarters, right on track, right on track, right on track. That 25th one was a, you know, that was that was a pain, okay. But you know, the point is that that's when you know you, you start asking yourself, you know, how you work your way, uh, you know, why am I really here, okay? So in any case. Um, you know, we worked through, we actually, we got the team out, out there, we salvaged the project, everything went, uh, you know, went according to plan. We were supposed to go public in March, we went public in April, okay, no big shakes. Uh, and I can't even tell you what day or what price we went out, you know, okay, because at the time I was having such a ball, um, you know, we were, with the clients that we were having, and ultimately in the four years that I was out in California, it, it, it was just terrific because we were hiring great people. We were doing great work for customers. Every project was a lot of fun you know, during those first four years. Um, and uh, you know, we, we had customers like Microsoft was one of our customers. Microsoft, HP, Charles Schwab, um, um, Cisco Systems, Bay Networks, Netscape. Um, you know, these were all of, you know some of the customers that we were doing business with and helping them get their IT infrastructure set up. So it was an awful lot of fun. But there was always this end of the quarter push. Can we get that project done? Can we get that project started? Anyway, you know, here's the bottom line. Um, gradually, as, as, you know, as time went on, you know, we continued to grow the company, you know, maintaining our values as best we could. We had an orientation program. And every year, I would ask myself, is this what you still want to do? Is this what you're still capable of doing? And do you still believe in you know, what the company is doing? And I remember um, you know, it started to come undone after I'd been there for about five years. And you know, the fellow who had originally hired me, Bob Jett, left the company. And we started to get to the point where it was all about the numbers. It was all about the numbers. Every quarter, every month, every meeting, it was all about the numbers.
Okay? You know, it was no longer what customers were important to us, what are projects important. You know, it was all about the numbers. You know, as it worked through from there, it just kind of gradually eroded. And little by little, you know, basically what was happening is the business had changed. There were other competitors in the marketplace, and we hadn't kept ourselves fresh from a company point of view. We were still going out there and pitching client server, and this thing called the web was kind of creeping up out there. You know, we started doing web projects. In fact, you know, the next assignment that I had, uh, after f four years in California, I ran all of the international operations based out of Stockholm and then out of London. Um, and so I, I started, I toured the world, literally. 17 countries, 24 offices. Um, you know, I, I built up every year about, you know, two or 300,000 miles, you know, frequent flyer miles. Um, and, uh, well, you know, I, I tell you what, you know, it got so bad that I literally had overhead bins and tray tables put into my home, so I felt more comfortable when I was actually uh, in my apartment. You know. But, uh, you know, literally, it, it, it was a situation that, um, uh, where, hey, you know, you had to grow fast. You had to continue to grow. You had to push it. It was, you know, it was constant that way. And it was the first time, actually, that I had inherited something, okay, because out on the West Coast, I had built all that up pretty much on, you know, I started with a group of 10 people, we got to know each other well, and then we built it up. When I went out to Europe, there was a group of 500 people, and, you know, over the next three years, we basically tripled that in size. Um, but it, it was different, you know, because you were dealing with legacy stuff, you had to build an organization that already had its own culture, so you had to change the culture. That's a tough thing to do, okay? So you also got to recognize, anytime you step into a company, the culture that you see, okay, will not be there forever, but it's very, very hard to change. Um, you know, and don't, and don't go into a company ignoring something like that and thinking, ah, you know, that's not so bad, I'll be able to, to ignore it. You know, you won't. Um, and here's, you know, the fundamental lesson of it all. I had a great time when I was traveling all over the world and doing all of that stuff, but it was incredibly hard, and I was incredibly burnt out. And, um, you know, I remember when I was out in California, I couldn't even tell you what the strike, pr what the stock price was. Okay, I found the last year that I was in Cambridge, my final year there, as we were going through the toughest time, I was checking the stock price multiple times a day. Okay, and the issue was, I was hoping that this was going to make up for a lack of that. Okay, you know, and so when you get those things out of balance, you know, you got to have the lifestyle. You've got to have the ambition. You've got to have the content and the people in the right balance for you. And it changes over time, okay? You know? And if they're not, it's just going to break at some point, and you've got to do something about it proactively. Um, during that period of time when I was in Europe, I actually got married, um, you know, which was a surprise to many people, including myself, because I, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> literally, I. I was like, wow, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, because I actually, I, I got started pretty late in life because I had spent all my time working. Um, and I, I'm somewhat embarrassed to tell you this, but there had been a period of five or six years when I literally had not had a date because I was so totally absorbed in, uh, you know, in work. And, you know, the first two years that my wife and I were married, we were living in London, and I, I, I can tell you, uh, without hesitation, that I probably saw her, you know, 50% of the time or less, you know, because of the uh, the travel, uh, you know, and so that also, you know, was a factor related to, you know, that the now the lifestyle thing became, you know, a different factor to me, you know, and now we have a, you know, little, she's about so tall, <laughs> she's 10 months old, and that's, an, you know, that's another thing that you got to work your way through, okay, um, so in any case, it was. Uh, uh, you know, so early 1999, I decided, you know what, back off, chill out. I, uh, you know, I, I decided that I was, I was going to leave Cambridge, and I, uh, I did. Um, uh, you know, which was now a very different place than what I originally conceived of it to be. It was 4,500 people. I was managing 13, 12. I forget it was 12 or 1,300 people. You know, most of whom I didn't know. Okay. Um, you know, many of the people who knew me knew me through video conferences. Okay. Uh, I would walk around and people would say, hey, I, you know, I know you, and I would say, you know, I'm, I'm glad you do. Uh, um, but, you know, it wasn't that same level of intimacy 
you know, with the people and the projects and so forth that I was comfortable with. And I was typically dealing with situations where, you know, they were either sales calls on the front end or ugly situations where the project had gone very wrong and now I was dealing with, you know, uh, kind of fixing it uh, sort of situation. And, you know, and so it was a very, it was a very different life, you know, and you've got to work your way through. Um, again, keep, you know, keeping the things in, uh, you know, in check. Um, so I took a few months off and decided, eh, you know, what the heck, got back to the United States, uh, you know, decided I didn't want to do services anymore and started up a small company and because I wanted that intimacy back again, okay? Now, small companies are great, but you've got to recognize that they can change on a moment's notice, all right? Um, you know, somebody was talking to me, I think Teresa was mentioning it earlier on, what's it like, you know, the difference between working for a very large company and a very small company? Well, you know, here's the bottom line. At Cambridge, you know, I pretty much, I, I, was, I was making, you know, a, a higher salary than, you know, I, I was going to be making at any startup, okay? Um, I had all the perks associated with being a senior executive, you know, in terms of flying business class and the limousines and taking, you know, and the, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, this, I had, a, I had a, an office that was, you know, pretty much a third of the size of this room, okay? And, you know, that's all great at one level. Uh, you know, it, it depends on what it is that motivates you, okay? So I had, you know, a very secure job, a very secure salary, a very, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, I wasn't satisfied on, you know, other levels. And it just comes down to the individual, all right? You know, the larger the company, the more secure it tends to be, but, you know, the less direct impact you're going to have, okay? Unless it really is a tremendously run and well-managed company that, you know, is able to capture, um, you know, the excitement of a, you know, a series of small organizations collected together. One of the things that we were able to do at Cambridge for a great period of time until Bob left is we had this whole notion of regional offices that we never wanted to get larger than 100 or 150 people, okay? You know, in fact, we tried to keep them that, you know, the idea is once they got to 100, they split into groups of 50 and then grew again and then grew again. And, you know, in that way, there was always that sense of intimacy and self-determination, if you will, as long as everybody kept a consistent, you know, you know consistent values, consistent methodology, consistent, you know, uh, process and consistent values, del you know, delivering to the customer, you know, and that was working. Um, and then you get to the next stage, uh, where you know that worked up until we were, uh, God knows, about five hundred million dollars uh, in revenue and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three thousand, thirty-five hundred people. And then we needed to go to the next stage, which was business units. And at that point, I completely lost touch with everybody because I became, you know, a business unit head. And I spent most of my time with my direct management reports. And my distance, you know, from me to the project team was now, you know, four or five levels. And, you know, it, it started to get to be, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of remote for me. Um, but uh, anyway, those are, those are some of the trade-offs. Uh, um, let's see, I, I, I want to end this and then I want to open it up to whatever questions that you all might have. But, um, um, you know, the other thing that I would say to you is that, um, and everything changes, okay? You know, like I said, I mean, you take a look at it, and a year ago, you know, people could not build websites fast enough. There were so many venture capitalists that were out there. You, if you had a, you know, the cool thing was to have a dot-com idea scribbled on a napkin, you know, and how you're going to grow this thing, and in 18 months, take it public, and people would fund you, okay? You know, remarkably enough, life has changed. And now people are looking for long-term sustainable value. It's all about profits. It's all about practicality. It's all about you know, making sure that you have a long-term sustainable business model. Okay? That's what it's always going to be about. And what I'm going to say to you is make sure as you go through those four factors that you're assessing you know, that you always think your way through you know, what is the business model, what is the value proposition. You know, and make sure that uh, you know you got all of those uh, all of those bases covered. You know, so with that, I'm going to thank you for you know, your time and your patience. You know, listening to me uh, uh, to me for this period of time. Um, why don't we open it up for questions? For uh, when, when I was in L.A., one of the coolest things that happened to me was I, I actually ran into Jerry Seinfeld once at a closed door. You know, <laughs> it was actually kind of cool. I'll tell you this story. Hold on. So you know. Um, 
the two things that I would do to, you know, because I was working all the time, I had no life, right? Um, you know, the only thing that I would do in, when I was in L.A. that I really loved doing is I was teaching um, this group of inner city kids in, in L.A., you know, the Internet. And most of the, you know, the kids were multicultural. And so what I would do is I would take them on guided tours of their, you know, home country using the Internet. Uh, it was pretty cool because the first time I went and lectured to them, they loved it. The second time I went and lectured to them, they hated it, and they actually started throwing things at me. And so I told, I figured I, I had it to get multimedia on them. And this was actually in like 94, 93, 90, yeah, probably 94, 95. And so I, I took my little LCD panel and, you know, used my internet connection. And from then on, they were absolutely thrilled. And that was the, you know, the greatest thing in the world that, you know, that I, I could possibly do. Um, I still love that and still ultimately that's what I'm going to do uh, in, uh, you know, in a few years' time. But the other thing that I was doing is, you know, I'd love to, I had to get myself, you know, look in L.A. I mean, I had, I, <laughs> right? I had, uh, <clears throat> I had always been a little bit um, uh, young for my position, so I'd always dressed very seriously and seriously even more so by Boston standards, right? So I was, I was a little bit uptight when it came down to L.A. And so I'm going to all these clothes stores trying to get myself redone. So I'm walking, you know, I'm in there, and I go, you know, go into this, this place down in, you know, Rodeo Drive or wherever it was. And, you know, the one was, oh, you look perfect in that jacket. It's beautiful, you know, this, that, and the other. And I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, you know what? You know, I mean, the, the, the mirror thing, it's, it's, a, it's a little long. She goes, no, that's the style. I'm like, no, it's a little long. <laughs> And we get into this, it's a little long, no, no, you know, back and forth. I'm finally, I'm, you know, I'm getting a little irritated by this, right? And I said, look, you know, I want to buy this thing. All I'm telling you is shorten it up a little bit, you know? And she goes, look, I cannot, you know. And it got, it got a little calm. And finally, I turned to actually face her. And I said, wow, that's Jerry Seinfeld, who was, I forget, he was sitting there trying on a pair of shoes. I said, look, it's a little long. And if you don't believe me, ask that guy sitting there what he thinks. I said, look, what do you think? Is it long or is it? And he looked at me thinking, oh, my God, an axe murder. Uh, <laughs> and he looked up and he finally said, you know, and, and then he realized, OK, I'm bigger than him. It's not that. You know. <laughs> and so, he, you know, he goes, well, step back a little bit. Let me take a look at you. And then he goes, wave your arms around a little bit. <laughs> He goes, jump up and down some. He goes, I'd take a quarter inch off. So I said, you know, take a quarter inch off. So I'm up at the counter, um, uh, you know, about to pay. And, you know, Jerry is there about to pay for Jerry. Like, I know him real well, right? Uh, so he's up there paying for whatever it was that he was paying for. And, you know, he pays for everything. He says, you know, what, would, you, would you like a bag? He goes, yeah, sure, put it in a bag. And they start to put the shoes in this bag. And he goes, wait, wait, you can't give me that bag. That bag's huge. I can't walk around with that bag. I, he goes, I'm about to go to the movies. If I walk into the movies with that bag, they're going to say, hey, look at the guy with the huge bag. So anyway, that was my coolest L.A. story. <laughs> then he turned and smiled and, you know, anyhow. <laughs> Yes. Um, I had two questions. One was, Please. Uh, you know, you, you said at an early point in your life you decided teaching was your passion. And yep. That was what you wanted to do. Yep. And I'm just interested in what made you decide to just put that off after the first few years. Well, you know, I didn't really, I didn't necessarily put that off, uh, you know, because I think that a lot of what I do now is teaching, but, I, you know, it's, it's in a different context, okay? Uh, the, the question was, you, you decided early on in your life that teaching was your passion, and then after a few years, you put that off. Uh, what I found that, you know, that I was doing, you know, the way that I approach management is fundamentally as a teaching mentoring activity. You know, and what I am the most proud of is you know, every situation that I have gone into where, you know, I'll tell you a story again about my experience when I went out to the West Coast. Uh, you know, I remember um, after I had been out on the West Coast for about three years or so, I decided to do something very novel and to take a vacation. Um, you know, when I went and I took a vacation, I came back, and when I got back from this vacation, there were, you know, my email was overflowing, my voicemail was overflowing, people had even left me messages on the door of my home. I kid you not. 
And I realized, you know what, you're doing something really wrong here. You know, because ultimately what you should be doing is building an organization where if you got you know, hit by a truck or decided you know, more positively to go on vacation for a while, you know, everything would work without you. That's the goal. That's what you've got to be doing. And so to me, it was all about building an organization, building people, you know, and helping them you know, get to the, uh, you know, to the right level. And I think that was why the first five years that I was at Cambridge was really so exciting because we were building something and I was able to really help people and it was intimate, okay, that way. And that's why the last three years were really less uh, pleasant because it was more transactionally based around, okay, let's go over the parameters of the business, okay. You know, at, at a certain level it's kind of like, okay, what's going on with the business? Who are the, you know, who are the best clients? Who are the worst clients? You know, that type of thing. Uh, throughout it all, I've always tried to make sure that um, you know I find some way of you know of doing that teaching outlet. Um, like in LA, I used to do the uh, um, you know uh, not just the job, but also the uh, uh, the teaching locally. Um, um, uh, at uh, you know at some point in time, um, you know now I find myself spending a lot of time teaching my daughter. <laughs> And I'm back to a smaller organization where I can spend more intimate time with, you know, with people. Just you know, kind of. The fun part is I've been through this scaling an organization before. A lot of the people that are ours Digita haven't, okay. And so what I'm really enjoying is helping people go through that process. Was that your yeah. second question? Yeah. Yeah. My second question was you talked about your differentiated business model. Yep. Of having like a fixed price. Uh, that was at Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah. At Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how that in effect that worked because I think if you finish like two months ahead of time, the client's certainly not going to be very happy that, you know, they, at the time they'll settle on the price, but that's... Well, first of all, you, you were never going to be in a situation where you were that, you know, uh, you know that, that ahead of, uh, well, did we ever do well, that? We're, we're, I mean, even you know, if there was, you know, weeks of... No, no, actually, you know, the, the customer was reasonably, uh, you know, okay. What we would typically do in a situation like that is that rather, we wouldn't just say, okay, we're done, here it is, we're gone, okay. What we would do is we'd dramatically reduce the size of the team and therefore able to get them to go off to another project, okay, um, and tell the client here, what we're doing is we're, you know, we're ramping down support, we'd be happy, you know, we're, we're ramping down the team. There, you know, there'll be a smaller team giving you support, and actually, it could work out okay. Uh, you know, when we did it that way. Um, you know, I think the downside is if you go way over. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, the downside is if you know, and so our business was, you know, was based on being able to scope projects properly. Okay, and we had a, a methodology and a process for doing that. Now, one of the very interesting things is that we were very, very good at scoping projects that were of a certain size, six, nine months, one to three million dollars. When we started to try to use that same methodology for projects beyond that, we got into real trouble. Okay? And you know, I, I, I was personally involved in a couple of projects that went way out of control. You know, there was one that I, I, you know, I had originally sold, the worst one. We were a year late. You know, it was a, it was an, uh, hey, I'm, you know, it was a nine-month project, you know, and did it, it, it took, it was a nine-month project, it took, uh, not quite a year, it was 18 months, nine months late, yeah, you know, but, you know, it was a commitment that we made to a, cl a client, we honored the commitment, and, you know, um, you know, and they loved us for it, and they still use the system, so, I'm going to go and try and sell more business. <laughs> it was Pac Bell, anyhow, which is now Southwestern Bell, and who you knows? Which all comes back to AT and T now, doesn't it? Yeah. Other questions. Comments. How do you see Ars Digita as it is now in comparison to how Cambridge Technology Partners work? Is that size? Oh gosh, uh, how do I see Ars Digita compared to CTP when we were at that size? You know, we we're two hundred and twenty. Well, first of all, you know, the market is remarkably different. Okay. Um, but I mean, I think that uh, you know we built out a pretty good management team. You know, from an executive management team at Ars Digital, I'm I'm very very comfortable with you know the management team that we built out. I think the technical talent that we have at Ars Digital is actually stronger uh, than we had at CTP at the time. You know, I think the business infrastructure that we had at Cambridge was stronger 
than uh, you know more experience that we have than we have at Ars Digita at the you know at this point in time, um, you know, and so uh, I, I think that we're we're you know Ars Digita has a very very definitive purpose. Um, you know, I'm I'm really here because I, I want to change the way the customers derive value from software products. Okay, you know, and so you have a good quarter, you have a bad quarter, but you know that vision, that view, you know, that is what we're, um, you know, what's critical to me. Okay, uh, you know, we've got clear value proposition in terms of the flexibility, uh, you know, flexibility to reduce risk, um, you know, reduce total cost of ownership and simplicity of ownership with an Ars Digital solution. So we've gone through that process. Um, and, and we're out there really to uh, to, re to to help our customers um, deliver um, uh, really high impact web solutions, okay, with our platform, so that they can focus on differentiation and efficiencies, and we'll take care of the e-business infrastructure and the integration with our underlying software platform, the ACS. You know, and so that that's sort of the the model that we're using, that we're going to market with. Um, you know, as y'all know, it, it's the market is very difficult right now. Okay, you get a lot of. Um, I don't know how familiar that you you are with some of the services companies that are out there, but like Scient, okay, you know, Scient was the premier e-business you know uh, innovator. Okay, that they they call themselves. Um, they did one quarter last year. They did a hundred million dollars in revenue. Hundred million dollars—that's huge. Okay, you know, um, the next quarter they did eighty. This quarter they're looking like they'll do fifty to fifty-five. Okay, so it, it's, you know, it's becoming a very different market than it was. And um, you know, what we're focused on at Ars Digita is what is the long-term sustainable value, and that long-term sustainable value is in the software product. Ars Digita is emphasizing a new differentiated product. Distribution model. Yes, Teresa. In the software industry, is there any sort of percentage that sort of accepted that you need to plow back into the research? You know, it, it depends. It depends. You know, it's all, <clears throat> all in terms of the stage and state of a company. Okay, you know, but but generally you're looking at ten to fifteen percent. You know, with revenues back in R and D, is uh, you know it, it tends to be what. Uh, uh, what what you you like to see? Um, Ten is three. You know, this year at ours Digita, if I do the numbers right, we're more you know like fifteen to twenty, uh, per, you know, in, in percentage terms of you know if we make our plan and all that kind of stuff, right? But uh, you know that that just gives you a little bit of a perspective about where we're at in our own you know uh, stage. And is that like new totally new systems, or is a lot of it maintenance? Or it, it's com it's a combination of both. I mean, you know, you you um, you know, one of the critical things about being a software product company, which uh, you know we're we're you know maturing to from an Ars Digital standpoint, is that you know there has to be upgradeability. You know, when a customer buys your platform, they got to be comfortable that you know it's not going to be uh, obsolete. You know, in a period of time, and that if there are problems with it, that you know they can call up somebody and. You know, they uh, they get an answer and um, and some level of support. Now, most companies charge a fee for that. You know, the way the world works is usually people charge a license fee for the use of the software, and then they charge you know anywhere from 18 to 25 uh, percent of the original license fee per year for different levels of support. Okay, uh, you know, with ours Digita, we have no license fee because it's an open source. Uh, platform. Uh, if people do want support, you know, we have varying levels of support. You know that we uh, build them on a monthly basis for. Um, yes. I'm just curious. Uh, is is it a conceivable plan to get uh, ACS to work with Apache? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, one one of the things that we are most uh, um, look. You know, the goal of ACS. You know, the goal of ACS here is that we want to be. Um, you know these the worldwide standard for web development. Okay, last year we had 13,000 downloads of the software. Already this year we've had about 7,500 downloads of the software. So that's a tremendous pickup. You know if you start to uh, you know to play that out from a number standpoint. Um, you know and so we actually have done an implementation of ACS on um, Apache. We've done an implementation of ACS on IIS. Okay, and uh, you know. 
Uh, we haven't deployed the IIS one in production, you know, just so everybody knows. But we have deployed the Apache one in, uh, you know, in production. But you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, that's why we're moving pretty aggressively towards Java. The Java release was out in late January, and we're going to continue to go down that path, where it's not just Apache, but it's you know, web logic. Okay, it's uh, you know, iPlanet and folks like that as well. That we got to make sure that we uh, uh, we work with.